The 1950 World Cup was a landmark tournament. After World War II had meant that no competition could take place between 1942 or 1946, the fourth ever World Cup had to wait for the start of a new decade. The shadow of war loomed over it, with occupied partitioned Germany and occupied Japan ineligible for consideration. Many teams from behind the Iron Curtain also chose not to attend, meaning the powerhouse of European football that was hungry were missing. England, though, deigned to join in with global football's main event for the first time ever. Brazil is, of course, the country most synonymous with the World Cup, and 1950 was their first chance to host it. They expected to win it, too, but a collective psyche-shattering defeat in the final would lead to wholesale changes in the national team setup. Argentina would have been in with a decent shot at upsetting their biggest rivals on their own soil, but they never made it to the tournament. They had fallen out with the Brazilian Football Federation over their decision not to defend their Copa America title in Brazil a year earlier. A pay dispute had decimated their ranks. In 2014, former Argentina goalkeeper Amadeo Carrizzo told Reuters Di Stefano, Pipo Rossi and Padanera had left. It showed a lot that they were missing. Rossi was the midfield general and Di Stefano was in his moment of glory. It would not be until 1958 that Argentina joined a World Cup again. The structure of the tournament was markedly different to the current affair. One team qualified from each of four groups of four, and those teams then played in a final group round. England failed to make it out of the group stages, though they won their opening game, overconfidence cost them dearly in the second, and their World Cup bid was derailed by virtue of a 1-0 loss to a United States of America side filled with amateurs or semi-pros at best. According to Jeffrey Douglas's book, The Game of Their Lives, the untold story of the World Cup's biggest upset, Frank Borgie, the US keeper, had been a minor league catcher for a St. Louis farm team who now drove a hearse for his uncle's funeral home. The goal scorer washed dishes in New York. It was a blow to the national psyche for England, but nothing compared to what happened to the hosts. The Maracanazo, or the Maracana blow, which saw Brazil lose 2-1 to Uruguay in their national stadium, was the last game of the campaign, but it was only decisive as a result of fate rather than it being an actual final. It so happened that the points Uruguay earned in the game took them above Brazil in the table, seeing them win the tournament for the second and final time. In their first two final group fixtures, Brazil had beaten Sweden 7-1 and Spain 6-1, brushing aside the best Europe had served up in the tournament with ease. Uruguay had drawn 2-2 with Spain and scraped a 3-2 win over Sweden. Star striker Adamir topped the tournament goal-scoring tables with 8, and with a draw good enough for Brazil, the locals thought the tournament was as good as won. This was even more obviously the case once Brazil had taken the lead in the final game through their right winger, but Uruguay hit back with two second-half goals. That shot them to the top of the table and earned them the title. It was such a shock, such an upset, that there were suicides in Rio. Almost everything changed in Brazilian football after that. The team switched from blue shirts with white shorts to the now famous yellow and green ensemble. Eight years later, the rebuilding job would pay dividends, in large part thanks to a 17-year-old who went by the name Pele. But the scars of 1950 took a very long time to heal.